I'm Vegas Runner, back to break down Saturday night's Strike Force card live from Chicago. I'll be flying solo this week, was unable to be joined by my partner Dustin, but you can get his selections at the pregame forum. Dustin will be passing along his plays for Saturday's Strike Card event in the pregame forums, so just go to pregame.com. He's had the hot hand lately in the fight game. So make sure you check those out. Should be up later tonight. It is Friday. Now we have a nice main event for this weekend. A big one with Hendo and Fedor. But the uh, main card, there's five good fights. I definitely have some premium plays for this one. In fact, I have two premium plays already confirmed. And I will give leans out on the other three. With that said, if I'm able to confirm those leans... As premium plays, I will pass those along for free on Twitter. So you can follow my feed on Twitter, at Vegas Runner, and those will come Saturday for free if I'm able to confirm. Going into this weekend's card, 25-7 and 7 on the last 32 fight premium plays in 2011. So let's keep it going. I'm going to start off by quickly going over those three fights that I haven't confirmed, but I definitely have some leans. With that said... I've learned one thing when it comes to strike force. You can't be afraid to bet favorites. Bottom line, unlike the UFC, where the talent pool is deep, um, and on any given night, fighter A can beat fighter B, when it comes to strike force, the talent pool is a little uh, more shallow, and the talent gap is a little wider. Because of that, you have a lot of one-sided fights. So you can't be afraid sometimes to bet some chalk. With that said, let's start it off with some fireworks. And that one will be Paul Daly and Tyrone Woodley. Tyrone Woodley has taken this fight on only five weeks notice. Paul Daly, the veteran, was expected to fight Evangelista Santos, the Muay Thai Shootbox Academy uh, Brazilian. When that fight couldn't happen due to injury... It was offered to Woodley, and Woodley right away jumped on it and has been preparing for the last four plus weeks. Now, will that be a plus or a minus? He's been in shape, they say. You know, he's been staying in shape, and from what I've heard, they're not concerned uh, about him not being ready. On the flip side, for Daly, once again, UFC throwing them to the Wolves. We know the UFC, Dana White, does not like uh, Paul Daly. Any chance they get to put him in against a wrestler that won't make him look good, they're going to take it. So right away, this fight was offered to probably the next best wrestler uh, available. And that's exactly what they did. Now, now, when you look at it, Daly was training for a Muay Thai guy. And now all of a sudden... He's got to change that around and has four plus weeks to, to prepare for another wrestler. Um, with that said, I don't see anything on Woodley's resume to justify him being a minus 260, 270 favorite. Um, we all know Daly has knockout power. Um, he's 27 and 10. 20 of those 27 wins have come by knockout or TKO. And he is 8-2 and two in his last 10. His only two losses out of those last 10 fights was to Nick Diaz and Koscheck. Both guys are, are, are fighters who, who are... Diaz is going up against GSP next. And Koscheck fought GSP. Didn't win, but that's the level of fighter he lost to. Um, Woodley is an All-American wrestler. And that's never been a, a good thing when it comes to Paul Daly. So I give him a huge advantage there for Woodley. And from what I've gathered, his corner, his, his handlers say they will not play into Daly's hands, meaning they are not going to strike with him. They will make this a mixed martial arts fight, and they will, more importantly, force the action as far as the wrestling side of it goes. So don't expect to see Woodley wanting to exchange with Daly. If he does, it could be extremely dangerous. Um, bottom line is this. With, you know what you're going to get with Daly. He averages only half a takedown per fight. Um, so he's, you're no threat to be on your back against him. On the flip side, um, Woodley's strike defense is only around 39%. So you can land. If Daly lands, 
uh, it could be lights out for Woodley. So right now, to be honest with you, the only value I do see is on the dog. If Woodley wasn't such a highly touted wrestler, I'd be all over Daly in this one. But because they say he is that good of a wrestler, um, I just don't know if Daly will be able to overcome that. Koscheck showed how to beat him, and uh, since then, you know, you know what you got to do. So because of that, I can't confirm a play on this fight, but I do think the value may be with the dog here, and I have to give the nod to Paul Daly. Um, moving on to the next fight, it's Safadine and Scott Smith. Uh, Scott Smith has made a name for landing big punches. 17 and 8. 82% of his wins have come via knockout. With that said, he's only won one of his last four fights. Um, a, you know, he split against Kung Lee, lost to Diaz, lost to Daly. The thing with Scott Smith is this. He takes punishment. When you look, the average fight, he gets hit almost six times per minute, meaning he absorbs almost six strikes per minute. Um, you just can't make a career absorbing that kind of punishment. And the older a fighter gets, you, you start to see that rock iron jaw starts to get softer and softer. I think Safadine's going to test that jaw. Bottom line is this. Safadine's last fight, he lost to Woodley, who we just spoke about earlier. But what happened was this. Safadine abandoned his game plan and fell into the hands of Woodley's wrestling and lost the decision. This is strictly going to be a striking matchup. There's no threat of either guy really being taken down um, at first. I think if Safferdine feels Scott Smith's power, Safferdine can take Smith down where Smith isn't going to take Safadine down. So because of that, I have to give the advantage to Safadine. You know, it, it looks like a striking matchup. You got a Belgian kickboxer against Scott, you know, hands of steel, hands of stone Smith. Uh, because of that, uh, this is strike fest written all over it. And I really don't see a takedown. Um, all three losses for Safadine have come by decision. So it's obvious the kid could take a punch, but the level of competition isn't even close to what he's going to face come Saturday night. Bottom line is this. I've heard the weight cut has been tough for Scott Smith. I think that's going to weaken him in this one. And like I said, the iron jaw starts to abandon fighters as they grow older, as they absorb punishment. And I think Safadine could coast to a decision by being busier and landing more and possibly even finishing Smith by just overwhelming him with that Belgian kickboxing style. I don't see any threat to Safadine being taken down by Smith. Because of that, he's going to have to land, you know, one of those big punches. And I just don't see that happening. I have to give the lean to Safadine. With that said... He's a minus 260 favorite, and I just can't justify laying 260 on, on a fighter who just hasn't proven to me, you know, a, a, he can get it done against elite fighters. I think he gets it done Saturday, and right now the only lean I can confirm is Safadine or nothing at all because he will be ahead on the scorecards, and I do think he has that ability to land enough to take Scott Smith out. With that said, I'm not willing to lay that 260 just yet. So as of right now, just like with Daly, I have a lean the Safadine. Finally, the Army Ranger, Tim Kennedy going up against ruthless Robbie Lawler in a middleweight clash. Tim Kennedy just doesn't get much respect at all. He's 13 and 3, 54% of his wins by submission, 38 by TKO KO. So you can tell right there that he's extremely well-rounded. Um, at 31 years of age, he's won four of his last five fights. When you look at Robbie Lawler, he's 18 and seven, and 83% of his wins have come by knockout or you know TKO referee stoppage. Only one submission win out of those 25 fights. 
five of his seven losses, though, have come via submission. And I think that's where he can be in trouble here. Bottom line is this. Lawler poses one threat, one threat only. And that's that lead right hand with that power left hook. He's a southpaw. Southpaws are tricky, even in MMA. With that said, I think Kennedy can stay out of danger. Um, his takedown defense is 100%, meaning the kid isn't going to be taken down. Um, with that said, against Robbie Lawler, you don't have much to worry about as far as takedowns. Even though Lawler is a skilled wrestler, he just has abandoned his wrestling game and has strictly relied on that powerful left hook um, for some reason or other. Again, Lawler is now 29 years of age and he's been in too many wars for my liking. Um, I think Kennedy will be able to outstrike Lawler. He's a lot more well-rounded and I think if this one gets to the ground, Lawler will end up getting submitted. Um, look for Kennedy to go to 5-1 and one in his last six fights. And uh, remember, two of, his last, two of his three losses have come by decision. So not an easy kid to knock out. With that said, I hope he doesn't just stand in front of uh, Lawler. He uses angles, stays busy, and uh, should be able to get the win. Kennedy, again, minus a 240 favorite. Um, but that's the only way I can look in this fight. I don't see any value in taking the 2-1 to one on Robbie Lawler. So again, this isn't a confirmed play, but I definitely have a lean on Lawler. So those three leans were Daly at plus 200, Safadine at minus 240, and Tim Kennedy at minus 240. Again, two favorites and a dog. If I'm able to confirm, I'll pass those along on Twitter at Vegas Runner come Saturday. Let's get to these premium plays, see if we could improve on that 25-7 and seven record Saturday night. Let's start off with the ladies. We have a welterweight title fight with Conan against Tate. Both girls have some fans, good-looking women, and uh, from what I'm hearing, this should be an extremely good fight. This has been in the making for a while. Let's not forget they signed the fight already. Tate backed out due to injury. According to Conan, she backed out because she wasn't ready. Conan's exact quote was this, sooner or later, Tate has to woman up and face me. That's going to happen come Saturday night. Bottom line is this, Tate's been out of action for over a year now. Um, she's 11-2 and has not been submitted. When you look at Conan, she comes from the Netherlands. Usually those fighters are kickboxers, just like Brazilians are usually Brazilian jiu-jitsu specialists. You would think coming from the Netherlands, um, she'd be a kickboxing specialist. Just the opposite. She's a submission artist. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see if she can give Tate her first submission loss. With that said, just like most Brazilians have a jiu-jitsu game, um, I think it's obvious Conan can strike. Um, with that said, let's not forget, this one's a five-round fight, and Tate's been out of action now for a while. I do not think that's going to bode well come Saturday night. Bottom line is this. They both land around the same percentage of strikes. Okay, They both are, are as busy... Both connect with the same amount of, of you know, percentage. Um, with that said, the strike defense for Conan is so much better. Her strike defense is 66%, means she blocks or gets out of the way of 66% of strikes. On the flip side, opponents have been able to land over 50% of strikes against Tate. So her defense is not quite at that elite level. When you look at Conan, she's 6-2 and two in her last eight fights. She just beat um, Carmouche in March. She beat Kaufman, both by submission. Her last loss was to Santos. Well, uh, what can you say about that? I, who wouldn't lose to Santos in the women's division? And most likely, most of, a lot of the men's division as well. Um, with that said... Looking back, Misha Tate fought Kaufman as well. 
She lost a decision to Kaufman. And like I said, Conan submitted her. When I looked at this fight, again, this is a coin flip. It's a minus 120 in favor of the champ. She has the title. Conan has the title. She should be favored. Because Tate has such a huge fan base, I think we're getting value on the, on the favorite in this one. I think there's value on the champ because of the huge fan base for Tate. Um, I think this is how the fight needs to go for Conan to win. She needs to show early on that she could strike with Tate. And when that happens, Tate will then allow this fight to go to the ground. If it goes to the ground, that's where Conan will be most dangerous and will be able to submit Tate. Conan, the thing with her is she'll submit you from the bottom. And, you know, she doesn't have to be on top to submit a fighter. Because of that, she's extremely dangerous. Bottom line, I have to give the nod to Conan here. I think the odds are right to step up and make a premium play on the title holder. So we're going to go ahead and confirm it right now. A premium selection on Conan to defend and retain her welterweight women's title over Misha Tate come Saturday night. Let's move on to the granddaddy of them all, the one we've been waiting for, Fedor, the last emperor, Emelianenko, against Dan Hendo Henderson. This is a fight I really want to see, I'll be honest with you. If this would have happened a few years ago, I don't know if it would be as interesting. Bottom line is this, Hendo comes in as the light heavyweight strike force champion. But this is at heavyweight. It's not at a catch weight. It will be at heavyweight. Hendo is not going up in weight as far as how he's going to enter the fight. Meaning, he's still going to come in as a light heavyweight. Remember, Henderson's one of those guys that doesn't cut weight for his fights. So he's not one of those guys who may fight at 205, but come fight night, he's going to come in and weigh it around you know, 215, if not more. He fights at 205, he comes in at 205. Because of that, Fedor is going to be the much bigger, heavier at least, fighter. Not the taller fighter, but the bigger fighter. Why this fight's so interested is this. Fedor's lost his last two fights. But let's stop for a minute and see who's he lost to. His first loss was to Fabricio Verdum, who may be the best submission fighter on the planet. If not, you know, definitely in his weight class. And even in that fight, Fedor dropped Verdum, who more or less played possum, and Fedor went for the finish and got caught in an armbar. Not much you can do there. I don't think after that fight, the stock should have dropped as much as it did with Fedor. But in his next fight against Bigfoot Silva, he got destroyed. Let's tell it like it is. He didn't get knocked out, has never been knocked out, but the referee did stop the fight after the second round, and you didn't see Fedor really uh, try to talk the referee out of it. And he, he got beat up in that fight, let's tell it like it is. And if the fight continued for another round, we would have just saw more of the same, and he just may have gotten finished. With that said, Silva's a big guy. You know, you don't get the name Bigfoot for nothing. You know, not only is he tall, but he's huge. Um, Fedor's not going up against that kind of fighter this time. He's going up against a much smaller guy. So he's not going to get pushed around. Don't get me wrong. I love Henderson. You know, I'll tell it like it is. You know, uh, he's an exciting fighter and he's given us a, a, a lot of great fights, um, especially back in his pride days when he held the title in two weight classes simultaneously. So he's had a great career. When you look at the odds of this fight, they opened with Fedor minus 275. The, the, the word was Fedor doesn't have it anymore. The air of invincibility is not only gone, but the uh, more or less his, his want to fight isn't there anymore. And we saw the odds drop as low as 200. When they did, Wise Guy stepped up to the counter and started unloading on Fedor. And to be honest with you, I think that's the right call. It's simple. Fedor may be 3-2 and two in his last five fights, but I just told you who he lost to. 
And I think if either of those guys fought Henderson, we'd see the exact same result, if not, you know, more one-sided. Um, when you look at Henderson, you know, people th might believe he's been the more busier fighter, but Fedor's had five fights in his last three years. Hendo's had six, you know? So, and when you look at Fedor, his 31-3 and three record, 50 some percent, 56 percent, 52, excuse me, have come by submission. Um, the other 50 percent, more or less, have come by TKO and decision, split right down the middle. So he can beat guys various ways. When you look at Henderson, it's more or less the same thing, except for submission. He's going to beat you one of two ways, by taking it down and grinding out the decision or landing that overhand right. Against Henders, against Fedor, excuse me, I don't think Hendo is big enough, even with his Greco-Roman wrestling, to take Fedor down, keep him down, and dominate him on the mat to get the decision. I also don't think, even if he lands that right hand, will it be enough to finish the bigger man like Fedor? Um, so I really think Fedor has more ways to win this fight. Um, when you look... At Fedor, it's simple. The air of invincibility may be gone, but in this fight and styles make fights, he'll be able to avoid the takedown. The size will not be an issue, and there's just too many ways to win. When you look at Dan Henderson, no submission attempts in his fights. Let's tell it like it is. He's not going to attempt any submissions. He averages less than half a submission per three rounds over his career. So there's no threat of getting submitted. His way to win this fight is by landing that overhand right. So I don't think the training camp was very difficult this time around for Fedor. It was, how do I avoid the clinch up against the cage? How do I not let this guy shoot on me and be able to take me down? And even if he takes him down, could he keep him down? And let's tell it like it is. For a wrestler, Henderson spends a lot of time on his back. His takedown defense is not very, you know, very good. Fedor's takedown defense is 78%. He, he stuffs almost 8 out of every 10 takedown attempts. Henderson's right around 59%. So out of every 10 times someone shoots, he goes down 4 times. And that's a wrestler. Um, and we know they're not comfortable on their, their back. So I, I think Fedor, don't be surprised after striking with Henderson, if he looks to take Henderson down and apply a submission. Bottom line is this. You never want to jump off a, a good company in the stock market. You never want to jump off a good fighter when their stock is low. That's when you want to back them. And right now, Fedor's stock is as low as it's ever been. Henderson on the flip side People are in love with it. I mean, everyone wants to see him win this fight. Um, you know, let's not forget, most fans are UFC fans. They have a dislike for Fedor. He hasn't been willing to sign and fight in the UFC. Yeah, UFC owns Strike Force, but he hasn't been willing to go sign and fight for the UFC. With that said, a lot of casual fans will be betting Dan Henderson. I think this line will drop again. When it does, I urge bettors to follow what I did, and that's jump up and bet Fedor. I made a premium play on him. I may upgrade this to a three-star best bet um, like we did with Santos uh, two UFCs ago come Saturday. So we may upgrade this fight because I really do like Fedor. Like I said, he's going to be the bigger man. He's the younger man. I believe he's the quicker man. And he just has too many ways to win. Yeah, the air of invincibility is gone. But styles make fights. And this is not a great matchup for Henderson at all. So look for Fedor to get it done. And uh, once again, start getting in the mix as one of the better heavyweights. If only he would have been able to cut down in weight. If this was at 205, like Dustin, my partner, said, who will be given his selections at pregame, at 205, Henderson would probably have been the bet. 
because Fedor has not won the cut weight through his career, and I think that would have been a problem for him. But this isn't at a catch weight. It's not at light heavyweight. It's at heavyweight. So based on all that, I give the huge lean to Fedor. I think this line should be closer to 350, to be honest with you. And I think even after the Verdum loss, if he didn't get one-sided by Silva, this line would have been over 300. Uh, because of that, the value is on the favorite, believe it or not. So let's go ahead, bet the last emperor, Emelianenko, to beat Dan Henderson come Saturday night in the main event. That's all five main card fights, two premium plays, one in the women's world title fight. We're, fight, we're back in Conan at minus 120. And then we're taking Fedor at minus 220, 240, 260. Not sure where it's going to land. I think it's going to come back down. He's hovering around that 220, 240 range right now. I think there's a ton of value there. Fedor by pretty much how he wants it because he's got too many ways to win this fight. All he has to do is avoid that right hand. And even if it lands, I don't think it'll be enough to finish the fight. Last Emperor gets the win. I'm Vegas Runner. That's going to do it for now. I'll be back with more boxing, more MMA. ESPN fights are tonight. I'll be live at the uh, Cosmopolitan, passing along live feeds, information, and bets from there. It's going to do it. I'm Vegas Runner. Enjoy the fight Saturday. Next time, I'll be back with Dustin, breaking down UFC and boxing.